One of the other things that research says is one of the biggest mistakes we make is we fall into the content trap because it's never about the content. It's never about the thing mm -hmm. that kids are worried about, that we're worried about as adults. It's about the fact that anxiety has hijacked our brain in that moment. Hey, I'm Jody, And I'm Chris. And we are Loving, Loving the, the outcome. outcome. Welcome to our podcast. We're a husband and wife who rock out together. We're parents of Milo and Ziggy. And we're following Jesus as best we can. Our story began in Winnipeg, Manitoba, where we fell in love, got married, and decided to sell everything and travel in our Jetta, selling CDs out of the trunk of our car. The road led us to Nashville, where we signed a record deal, started our family, and now the four of us travel together in our minibus, White Neptune. I know, crazy, right? Our life is a road trip. And we want to invite you into it. So come along for the ride as we chat with some of our favorite people about family, spirituality, wellness, and of course, music. Come on, let's go. This podcast is brought to you by Hope and Healing International. For $30 a month, $1 a day, you can sponsor a life-changing surgery for a little boy or girl living in Africa. We're talking about club feet, cleft palates, going from blindness to sight. In one year, you can literally send a healing hug and change a child's life. If you'd like more information, go check out the website at lovehealinghugs.com and you can see video of our buddy Bernard. This is my son, Bernard. He wants so much to be and play like the other children. But he can't. Instead, he suffers every day. As a father, I would do anything for my son. I love him, but sometimes this is not enough. They say they can heal my boy. I told them, I work hard, but I have no money to pay for it. They told me someone in Canada is paying, paying to heal my son. For over 100 years, Hope and Healing International has helped break the cycle of poverty and disability for thousands of children in the poorest communities, but we can't do it alone. For $30 a month, you will directly fund the surgeries, medical care, and rehabilitation for a child who would otherwise go untreated. A child just like Bernard. We will send you a picture of every child you help, their treatment plans, and progress reports. And each child we treat on your behalf will receive this bear to hug on their journey ahead. All you have to do is go online or call now. It's that simple. Thank you for making my son Smile again. Well, okay. hi, you take off. It's so wonderful to meet you through the screen. I know. It's so wonderful to meet you guys, too. Mm -hmm. Welcome to our garage setup. What do you think? I love it. It's awesome. That's the beauty. You know, you can have these conversations anywhere. And I think sometimes like we have these beautiful signs in our living rooms that say like, your mess is welcome here, but it's like a perfect living room. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe you though. <laughs> That's great. So here you go. This is for real. Um, sort of a picture of our life at the moment, except that there's a lot of joy amidst it, but it's messy. And yeah. um, I'm so, so grateful. I feel like this is a personal <laughs> request to do this with you. I know every listener is going to gain so much from it, but I also, I'm good friends with Ellie Holcomb and she yes. was, has always been reposting you. So I've just gained so much personally, my husband and I, um, from what you share, what you offer, mm -hmm. um, without ever meeting you in person, just from your offering online, really, mm -hmm. and books mm -hmm. and resources. And so I reached out to Ellie and I was just like, oh man, I really want to talk to her um, since our house flooded and since we've just been living through some stuff. Yes, you all have. I just am so sorry about all that y'all have been through. 
Yeah. You know what? It is new territory in this way. Like it's a new grief. It's a new trauma. Mm. Um, we all have lived through a year though, right? Mm. Like that's for sure. All of us. Yeah. Like there's no one that hasn't been touched by loss in some way. And so it's unifying in a strange way in that we yes. all know what it feels like. We're a little more acquainted maybe, but I don't know that we know what to do with it either. Mm. So um, I really just thought this would be a really sweet offering to friends and fans that listen to this podcast to just get to hear from you. Because obviously most of them have not gone through a flood. Some, I've actually had a lot of people reach out because that's what really? happens, right? Like, oh, we had a fire in our house. Oh, you know, X, Y, Z. But trauma takes all forms and fashions and just kind of still in the tail end of coronavirus world reality, I just thought this could be really helpful to have you help us a little bit talk through what to do with our feelings, um, how to deal with anxiety as parents, and maybe someone who's listening is not a parent. I I mean, we all worry. It's just, we all worry. (laughs) Absolutely, we do. Yeah. And we're all in new territory with this last year. We've never been here before. So, um, so personally, I wanted to talk a little bit about trauma and how to help my kids and my family. And just personally, that's where I'm coming from. But I also just know big picture. We're all dealing with different forms of loss and grief, worry, anxiety, and trauma. And I know that's a ton. We don't have 5 million episodes. We have one, but I just wanted to go there with you today. So, um, but before we jump in, are you from Little Rock? I I am. Okay. So tell us a little bit for people that don't know you, um, just give us a little bit of an introduction and why you, the why behind why you do what you do. Um, well, yes, I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas originally and moved to Nashville to go to grad school at Vanderbilt. And I think had, I grew up wanting to do something to help people. And my dad was in the hotel industry and really wanted me to do that. And I was not interested in that path, (laughs) but I think I just, I didn't really know, you know, I'm, I'm a lot older than you are. And when I was growing up, No one was even talking about counseling. I mean, I didn't know anybody else my age who was in counseling as a kid, but something in me kind of kept thinking, surely there's got to be more. There's got to be more places for us to go deeper, to have conversations about emotions and where emotions and faith connect. And, And my faith was really important to me growing up. And so it kind of was one step at a time. I feel like along the way, literally the only psychologist I'd ever heard of was on Days of Our Labs, which is kind of crazy. But, um, but then, so kind of the, the next door opened and the next door opened as God does with all of us. And so I ended up at Vanderbilt and knew, cause I knew that I had to go to grad school to pursue any kind of counseling and interviewed with Melissa Trevathan, who is still my boss. And that was in 1993. And oh. I sat down with her and she described this place that was counseling and very clinically based in terms of training and and where we go with kids, but so deeply relational. Mm. And we're in a yellow house and we have a white picket fence and there are 13 counselors and five dogs on staff at Daystar Counseling Ministries where I work. It's so fun. And so it really is like counseling meets mentorship kind of almost. It's kind of all the things coming together. And we have individual counseling and we have group counseling. And then in the summers, we have a little summer retreat program that I'm the director of. So if I have bags under my eyes, it's because I came home last night from our first session. Wow, but, oh my goodness. So I, I have had the privilege of getting to do that since 1993 and just am, am grateful to still be in the work. And, and out of that have gotten to write some books and do some speaking and have a podcast of my own. And that has been really fun, especially, you know, God's timing on things. I, we, I write a lot with Melissa, our director, and then David Thomas, who's kind of, I'm mostly over girls and he's mostly over boys, although we cross a little bit. And, and we had written a book together called Are My Kids on Track? And the publisher came to me and said, so you wrote this paragraph about anxiety in girls and how it used to be one in eight and now it's one in four. And, which we can talk more about that, but this was all pre-pandemic. And he said, would you write a book for young girls about anxiety? Because the average age of onset used to be eight, now it's six. So that's outside of the pandemic. 
And as a therapist, you know, you can probably imagine what I said. I said, I would love to write a book for little girls, but only if I can write one for their parents, because <laughs> it is not isolated to the kids. And so that was right before the pandemic started. And so it felt like God just gave me this way to help people that I would never be able to help inside the walls of Daystar, although we have 1900 families currently that are at Daystar, but it just expanded that in this beautiful way. And so I got to write these two books on anxiety and then the pandemic hit. And then, and these are all things we can talk more about if you want to, but then I got most worried about adolescence. So I thought I've got to write a book for teenagers. And so I cranked out this book in about eight weeks for teenage girls about anxiety. And so I have been so grateful to be in that space. And like you said, I mean, I, I, I have never been as active on social media and it's not exactly something I love in a lot of ways, but I feel like it's been a place I can connect and offer some things to folks who just, like you said, collectively, we have all gone through this trauma. We have all gone through this shared anxiety in a way that I think for most of us, we haven't been through in our lifetime. And so I just have been so grateful for the ways that I've gotten to step in with families and kids. And wow. I love how you said, well, I actually, I hate it because it's true and I don't want it to be true, but how it's not isolated, how you said you wrote a a book, you said, I'll only do it if I can write a book for parents and kids about anxiety. Talk to me about that. I don't really want to hear what you have to say, but I'm going (laughs) to, um, just because that has to be true. Um, so is there a correlation between how we are acting and what we're carrying and how we're dealing with anxiety and how it affects our kids? Talk to me about it. Yes, I'm sorry. I hate to even say it, mm-hmm. um, but the, that was this is not good news. But it's kind of good news. At least I do not want everybody who's listening to think it's my fault because there does not need to be any shame around that. And and statistically, if as a parent you have anxiety, your kids are seven times more likely to have it themselves. Wow. That's yeah. That's just the data that's out there, and part of that is purely genetic, that there's nothing you can do. And honestly, I I mean, part of it is, I think, because of this really great place that we're in culturally now where, you know, I think somebody said to me one time, like, we're the first, and you probably more than me, but you're the first generation of parents who are really seeking healing Mm. and emotionally healthy, which I thought was such a great way to say that. Mm. And out of that, What's happened is, and counseling almost 30 years at this point, you know, I see a lot of shifts in kids. I'll see a lot of shifts in parents. And so what I'm seeing is a lot of parents who've gotten really in touch with where they are emotionally and even what they wish their parents would have offered them. Mm -hmm. And so they're overcompensating. And so Mm -hmm. what I'm seeing is parents who are often attending more to the anxiety than to the resourcefulness that helps us work through the anxiety. Mm. Okay. Wow. You know, because whatever we pay most attention to is what we're reinforcing. So we just, do we as parents, like we're so worried about going, like not equipping our kids or not helping them deal with what no one helped us deal with that we're just doing too much, but not doing the right things. Well, it's out of the best motivation and a lot of the right things, because where we want to start is, I mean, I wish every family had a feelings chart. Like I wish every family was passing it around the dinner table and naming three feelings every night. And we were doing a great job of teaching kids to talk about sadness and anger and disappointment because a lot of kids and, and actually the reason I called the book, the little girl's book is called Braver, Stronger, Smarter, because kids who are anxious, parents who are anxious, always kind of follow this same temperament. And they're always really conscientious. They try really hard. They're bright. They care deeply. And it's like, they just can't turn the volume knob down. Mm, and so I don't know that, about that, I don't, I don't, know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. hmm. so, so a feeling what, start. that's, yeah, that's a tangible, fairly straightforward takeaway. That yes. every parent that's listening or non-parent, every right. human being listening, we can all do Cause, that. Exactly. Because for all of us, what happens is because we're conscientious, because we're trying hard, we care about other people. We're the people who don't want to say, 
you hurt me or you made me really angry or I feel really disappointed in this situation. And so it kind of morphs, you know, it shoots out sideways as emotions do and morphs into anxiety a lot of times. And so I think when we are, and again, like you talked about any trauma that we're going through, I think when we're expressing emotion in healthy ways, we're going to offset a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression that could come as a result of it. And so, mm. so that's where we want to start. And I think parents are doing better than they've ever done at that. Mm. But then what we want to do is we want to equip, equip kids with coping skills or equip ourselves with coping skills where, yes, I feel fearful in this moment, but here are the things I can know to get through it. Because so I, I wrote, I read a lot of books on anxiety before I wrote these books and yeah. the, I have a lot of research in my brain, but one of the things that, that it said that I thought was really interesting are the two primary things that parents do, or I think adults do too, when anxiety arises are the, are, I mean, I'm sorry, are um, escape and avoidance. Those are our two primary strategies, escape and avoidance. Woo. But every researcher would say, or every psychologist, counselor, anyone in my field would say, to work through our fear, we have to do the scary thing, including kids. And so we want to give them coping skills and help them move toward what's making them fearful with help. Instead of just, I know you feel fearful, and so I'm going to take away the thing that's making you afraid. That's not That's helpful. where the, almost the microphone <laughs> should be over, whatever, I can't, what, what did you call it again that we do? The, say that again. You said not micromanaging as parents, but you said we tend to um, us what we do as parents step in and like over attend, over attend. Yeah, almost just yeah. I see what you mean. It's like we're really good at saying honoring those feelings in them, right? But not necessarily great at going. Okay, now what do we? How do we move through this? Right. You can do it. You mm -hmm. got this. Here you yeah. go. <laughs> right. Oh, man. Okay. I think what I need to ask too, before we go too much further is the worry and anxiety. What's the difference between those two things? That's a great question. So, I mean, we all worry. We yeah. all always have worried. I mean, I think if we're functional adults, we worry to some degree. Yeah. Help right. Move mm -hmm. forward. So the way that I would typically categorize the difference in my office is you know, worries kind of come and go. Something pops into our mind. We all have these intrusive thoughts. So worries pop into our mind and then typically they move out, especially whenever the thing is that we're worried about is over. But for anxiety, I talk about it with kids a lot, like the one loop roller coaster at the fair. Mm. So they have that intrusive thought and then the intrusive thought gets stuck and it goes over and over and over and they don't know how to get it out. Mm. And so, like, I remember one of the first times I ever realized that was what was happening. I had a little girl in my office who was really bright, really conscientious. She was a truth teller to, the, to a fault, which is one of the symptoms of anxiety. Kids who overconfess a lot of times are anxious. And so this girl, I, I mean, she also would never have cheated. I mean, I just knew her well enough to know she'd never cheat in school. And she came to me and said, I cheated today in school. And I said, tell me what you mean about that. Hmm. And she said, well, I was sitting in class and all of a sudden it popped into my head. I don't want to cheat. And so I started thinking, don't cheat, don't cheat, don't cheat. And she said, and then I glanced over at my friend sitting next to me and I thought, did I just look at her test? Oh no, maybe I looked at her test. And she said, and then I glanced back again and I thought, oh no, I did look at her test. I cheated, I cheated. Oh no, I cheated. To the point that this sweet conscientious kid went up to her teacher and said, I cheated on the test Aww. today. And she didn't cheat. She, it just Aww. got, she just got hyper-focused on it and couldn't get out of the loop. Yeah. And so that's what happens. And it can be, you know, it can be, it's fascinating how it works with kids. It really follows their development. And so, and I think it's true of us as adults too, whatever is kind of the scariest thing they can imagine happening, that's where they get stuck. And so for little ones, it's something bad happening to my mom or dad. And then, you know, they get a little older and it's some like failing on a test or something that's going to embarrass me, or they get a little, you know, it just shifts over and over, which is why I think a lot of parents will say to me, I never had anxiety till I had kids. And then all right. of a sudden you think about something bad happening to one of your kids because it's the scariest thing that you can imagine. Can we stop right there? Because I'm experiencing that with 
a bunch of friends right now. Mm-hmm. Yes. yes, a lot of conversations going. And I think, so I'm Ziggy, Ziggy and Milo are five and then 18 months younger. And um, so I don't have a newborn right now, but I do remember, especially kind of like the blues would set in for me, mm. the sunset or around nursing. Um, but yes. so I'm a little bit out of that phase, but I have a lot of friends in that phase with newborns. What would you say to the newer mom or just to a mom who is having that exact worry? Like, how do you talk to moms about that? So the, yeah, maybe it's a bigger question and just about how to get out of the anxiety loop, really. But yes, you I mean, you nailed it in that because one of the other things that research says is one of the biggest mistakes we make is we fall into the content trap because it's never about the content. It's never about the thing mm-hmm. that kids are worried about that we're worried about as adults. It's about the fact that anxiety has hijacked our brain in that moment and Literally, it has hijacked our brain. And so what happens is, you know, when you and I are having a conversation and we're both enjoying ourselves, we have blood flowing all throughout our brain, including going to the prefrontal cortex that helps us think rationally and manage our emotions. When we get really anxious, the blood vessels in our brain constrict and it shifts the blood flow away from that prefrontal cortex into the amygdala. And the amygdala is the fight or flight region Mm -hmm. of our brain. And so I will sit with parents who will say, my child is like a crazy person when they get to this place. Like I can't talk them out of it. Or maybe we think I can't get my, I can't talk myself out of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Because the thinking part of our brain isn't even online. It's just not working in those moments. And so what we've got to do is we've got to do some really practical things to get ourselves out of the loop. The first being to calm our bodies down. And so that's where deep breathing and all the mindfulness stuff is so important because when we can take deep breaths and I have really practical ways, I do it with kids and grownups in my office. When we are deep breathing, the blood vessels in our brain dilate again, and it shifts the blood flow right back to the prefrontal cortex. Mm, Breathe. Yes. Breathe. 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 Yes. Mm. And the way I I do it with kids is I will have them draw a square on their leg. It's called square breathing. I call it that with girls. Now with boys in our office, we call it combat breathing because because it sounds cooler. And also the Navy SEALs use it before they go into any kind of situation. So they literally draw a square on their leg. And with each line of the square, you breathe a different way and pause in the corner for three seconds. So anybody who's listening right now can do it with us. So you Mm. breathe in, pause for three seconds, breathe out, pause for three seconds. And 20 seconds of deep breathing resets the amygdala. Wow. That's all it takes. Isn't that interesting? We think we make it so much more, not that we make it more than it is. It is a big deal. Right. But we tend to over-exaggerate. Okay. How do I, it's like, breathe, drink some water. Let's start Let's start there. Start there. Hmm. Exactly. Good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And what I would go to next. So these are kind of my top three things I do in it counseling. Is true. This mm-hmm. is like first three counseling sessions. Um, so thank you. <laughs> so the the cool thing about drawing the square on the leg is it's also a grounding technique, which you may be familiar with that, but cognitive behavioral therapy is the most widely researched type of therapy with anxiety. And so grounding techniques are one of the kind of the go-to things with cognitive behavioral therapy. And so anything tactile or sensory related is grounding because, you know, if you're anxious, you're not in the moment when you get in that loop, Mm. you spun off into whatever past future, but you're not in the present. And so again, that sensory data kind of pulls us to the present. So the square is one of those things. So What I would normally do with a child or a parent or anybody is I would start with the breathing, teach them some strategies with that. Then we would move to grounding techniques. And so my favorite ones are, well, my favorite is five, four, three, two, one. And you can call it a game with kids, but it's all the senses. So, you know, if we were sitting in my office right now at Daystar, I would say, tell me five things you see right now Mm -hmm. and have somebody literally focus in and pick five things that they see in the room. Tell me four things you hear. Mm -hmm. Tell me three things you feel, not emotionally, but tactile. Tell me two things you smell 
and tell me one thing you taste. And it can be any order. It doesn't matter. We can mix up the order, but especially like taste and smell. I mean, you have to really zero in on where you are mm. and what's happening. Um, I also have counselors who will make kids go walk outside barefoot in the grass sometimes <laughs> because yeah. that sense of like tactile, I can feel the blades of grass under my feet. Yeah. You know, just anything that does that. I will have kids do math which is not tactile, but it really engages our brain. So like older kids, I'll say, I want you to count backwards from a hundred by sevens. So, I mean, for me, that would require a lot of focus. So yeah. I was like, Don't anything, <laughs> right, right. So anything that pulls us out of that loop, that's basically what we're doing in the moment is pulling them out of the loop. And then the third thing that I love to do with kids is I have them name their worry. So whatever form it's taking for a parent, I mean, we do this as grownups too, but, you know, say you're a young parent and you're having the blues when you're nursing and you start to get anxious about, you know, well, what if I put my child back in the crib and something happened, you know, whatever it is that you start to loop about. Yeah. So then to, to do your grounding, to, I mean, to do the breathing, to do like the five, four, three, two, one. And then I want everybody to give their worry a name. So with little kids, I'll have them call it the worry monster sometimes or let them create their own name. My favorite is I have a girl who named hers Bob. I have (laughs) no idea why, but it's awesome. Bob, Um, with the high schoolers in the high school book, I called it the worry whisperer because that's what it feels like. It's like this voice that starts to whisper. And and anytime, I mean, for any of us, until we can learn to name that voice, we think it's truth. And especially kids. You know, they just have no category for that. And so when we can help them say, well, my worry monster has been telling me, you know, if I fall asleep, somebody's going to break into our house and they're going to hurt you, mom. And I'm scared. I don't want to go to sleep because of that. Mm. So then what we do is we start with naming it. And then we say, well, what do you want to say back to your worry monster? Mm. Or what do you want to tell Bob? You know, and little ones, I'll have them like stomp their foot and shake their little finger and Bob, you're not the boss of me or letting them even say words like stupid that they wouldn't be able to say yeah. normally you're stupid with teenagers. There's, I have a lot of groups of adolescents and it's so fun to see them encourage each other in it. Like they'll say, you know, I don't know what Bob's been telling you, but he's an idiot and you are so much stronger than he is. And, and I think same thing when we can talk to ourselves like that, like, mm. why am I listening to worry again? I know worry's always wrong and he only wants to lie to me. So that is not the truth. And I'm going to go back to, and I think that's where even memorizing scripture can be great. Like that's where I'm going to go back to some truth that I know. And, and the cool thing about naming it too, because it's so based on temperament and we're not going to change the fact that kids or we are conscientious. And so anxiety is going to pop up yeah. again over time. And, and when we can say that's worry, whether it's, you know, worrying about somebody that they love that might get hurt or die or getting on an airplane, we can say that's Bob. He just came back with a new thing. We don't listen to Bob. What did you do that worked before with Bob? Because the same tools work regardless of what form the anxiety takes, which is so cool. That's so cool. As you're helping your kids through it, every mom, every parent's going, that's right. (laughs) Like you're doing it for yourself, which is very cool to be that together and be in that together. Yes. I think what I, it's interesting hearing you say this. It's so helpful because one thing I did, I, I try so hard not to lie to my kids because it's really easy to do. And it's super tempting. You're not even conscious that you're saying something that you actually can't guarantee. You right. know? Like, well, how do I know you're always going to be here? Well, mom's always going to be with you. Well, that's, I can't say that mm-hmm. with full, mm-hmm. truth, full confidence. It's not true. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I kind of became aware of that as I started mm-hmm. getting my kids to bed when they were talking to me, like, okay, am I saying the truth? And what I said to Milo and Ziggy the night of the storm in Nashville, because we were all in bed, I think we evacuated at 1230 a.m. Like they they would have already been sleeping, but the thunder and lightning was so loud. They were all in bed with me. And um, we usually have a pretty easy time. Bedtime, thank the Lord, has been great. I don't know if it's a product of the road and having to fall asleep in a whole bunch of places, but generally they're great. But storms are scary. Next yeah. level. So they're in bed with me. 
And Milo's watching out my window in my bedroom as the water is rising. And because I didn't think it was possible what happened Mm -hmm. would ever happen, like a flash flood where we literally had to evacuate in five minutes. I said to him, it's okay, honey, water doesn't get us in our house. Mm -hmm. And I said that. And the next day he said that to me. He said, really? well, you said it, it wouldn't get us in our house. And of course I played the shame game. Cause I felt, I felt terrible, but I, at the moment I just said, I know, honey, like I didn't think that could happen. I wasn't trying to lie to you. I just, I've never seen that happen before. Yeah. Um, and so that was the, the lie that I told him accidentally. And mm. so I've had a hard time letting mm. myself off the hook for that. Um, and so I guess I kind of wanted to ask you, you know, when we're talking to Bob or we're talking to the worry monster, Mm -hmm. but it's a real true, it's a fear. I mean, our fears aren't false. They're often real. Yeah. (laughs) What do we do with that? Yeah, I would say, I mean, for one thing, I do want you to let yourself off the hook on that because there, you wouldn't have ever known that. And he's not going to. At 15, he's not going to go back to you and say, but mom, you lied that right. time. So I don't have, you know, I'm discrediting you in every way. Mm. He's not going to do that. Um, and I think the way you handled it was great. And, and sometimes I think what we have to do is back up till we can get to a truth that we know. That's so, good. That's good. you know, maybe it's, you know, storms can be really scary, but God is always with us. Or God's going to take care of us. And that may not look the way we think it does. It may not look like our house is protected, but he's going to take care of us. Mm. Because even when the tragedies happen, when the real trauma does happen, he does. He still takes care of us. And, and so a good thing to revisit with him now, you know, yes. three months later to, mm-hmm. to talk about that. That's a, yeah. that's a good, it's a good call. Like, look, yeah. we're living in a di- we've lived in four different places, but we're together and look how God's taking care of us. And, you know, we do praise the Lord every night and that that's a, I could kind of really focus us a little bit more, even in that. Yeah. That's helpful. Back up till you uh-huh. get to the truth. Exactly. Till you get to a truth you can really, and, and they're so concrete. I mean, you kind of at, at their age, especially you kind of have to have something concrete Mm -hmm. that you can go back to. But I think anytime we're thinking about trauma and kids, part of what happens is we feel like there's a lot of information we need to convey to them. And so we sometimes give more information than they need out of our own fear. Processing it to our five-year-old. Exactly, exactly. And so with kids, I think the thing that's probably the most important is coming up with some kind of you know, say, I mean, obviously y'all have this trauma from the storm. And so the next time there's a really big storm coming, you know, to say to them, okay, you guys, there's a storm coming. Here are the things we know. You know, we know now that whatever you have in place that would, these are the, you know, I, I don't know exactly what you have in place at your house, but, or say there's something there. I have a family that I'm working with that they saw on their like ring camera recently, someone trying to get in their house mm. and in the middle of the night and the kids ended up waking up. And so wow. talking through that with them after that to say, that's why we have a ring camera. We can see people. It works. The things that we can do that we are doing within our control, within our power. Yes, exactly. And God's going to protect us. Do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. Always letting them kind of lead the conversation more with their questions because Uh, that's good. They're not asking some of the questions we're trying to answer. And then we just confuse them. Ah, that makes so much sense. Let them lead. Yes, exactly. And it's amazing. I mean, we have said this for a million years at Daystar, but, and I feel like I talk about it more around divorce with parents than anything else probably, but it's true again of any trauma that, that they have this innate sense of they don't ask till they're ready for the information. And so if they know they can't handle it, they don't ask. Mm. And, and that's why we don't want to give them more than what they're asking for, because something in their little 
psyches knows, I don't want to know that yet, or I can't handle that yet. And so that is where we want to let them lead. And then we want to think about one to two sentence responses that are concrete, that help them feel safe, and then let them ask the next question. That's really, really good. That's really good. You're going at their pace. Exactly. Mm, I love that. Yeah, it's been really interesting for me to, I think I was fearful of their fear. Like I was over worried about how they would handle it. I think partly because mm-hmm. a lot of people, that was their first question to me. How mm-hmm. are the kids? And you're like, sure. how are the kids? How are the kids? I, I mean, <laughs> I think they're okay. Are they okay? They were kids. Okay. Like you're more just like, so worried about that until you start to see they played flood at school. Um, Cause I asked, I checked in with teachers about just such great, they're, it's daycare, but we just call it school. And teachers. Yeah. And, um, yeah, about two weeks in, I just thought, let me just check. Cause I was seeing a few behaviors at home that were maybe a little more extreme versions of their normal selves. Um, mm-hmm. if you're a feeler, just a lot more feelings and yeah. that kind of stuff, but we're their safe place. So I wasn't sure how's it going at school. And I checked in and she's like, it's actually pretty cute. Like Ziggy loves to play flood at recess. And first I thought that was bad. And then I watched him we started going back to our house because we still have done, we're waiting on permits. It's been three months. Um, we haven't done a thing. It's just down to the studs, just sitting there. Ugh. You'll have to like mow the grass. You still have to take care of your property. And it's actually yeah. been very healing to have to tend to our broken home and mm. revisit the place you don't want to revisit. Almost mm. dealing with the fear, like you're saying, instead of avoidance and just what I want to do is what you said. You said the two biggest default settings or things we do wrong as parents is I think you said avoidance and you said escape, escape, avoidance and escape. That's what I want to do. Yeah. I don't want to go back there. I just want to forget about my house and the cul-de-sac that's stinky and just sitting there and like, I don't want to remember anything to do with it. I just want to stay in our little, you know, tree house. We're above our friend's garage in the tree house, house way above the ground where we're safe and going back there to, to tend to the lawn and, um, bike ride in the cul-de-sac with our friends has been, and play flood in the backyard. Mm. It was so different than I thought it would look, but it's been equal parts grieving and healing. Wow. As we do that. And what an amazing life lesson. Like we have to go tend to our broken home. I mean, the same is true of us emotionally. Like that's a, that's going to be an analogy that I bet you use forever. Remember, we have to go back to those broken places and take care of them. Ourselves. Uh, thanks for saying that back to me. I, I mm. don't even think we know what we say sometimes and still mm. someone says to you, that's going to be good, yeah. which is what God does. And we know yes. that. I think we sometimes just think that God working all things for good just looks like what we want good to look like. And you know, becoming more holy is, is hard and there's a lot of icky parts to it. And, and I love your reminder to, to name the fear and talk to the fear. I had written down in my journal a while ago, like when I make friends with fear, it doesn't scare me as much anymore. Mm. Um, And because I think as Christians, we love to throw around these big bumper sticker phrases (laughs) <laughs> professional Christians, you know, and I, I yes. do it all the time, but I've had a break from that during COVID. I haven't been on stage or in a church in a long time, just mm-hmm. started getting back into it. And you realize mm-hmm. you do those things. It's, yeah. it's those little lies. Sometimes it's just not the full truth. It's like, we don't <laughs> think God is capable of meeting us in the brokenness, or I don't know. I don't know what it is. I haven't figured that out, but we feel this need to close the story loop with a nice bow. Mm-hmm. Um, I do that a lot. And I've stopped doing that since this to just go, no, I don't, I don't need to, to say faith over fear, faith over fear. Let's live from a place of faith. <clears throat> not fear. It's like, that's not true. <laughs> Both. Yeah, right. It's always there. Yeah. Yes. It's always there. And so we're making people feel shameful that have mm. fear and anxiety inadvertently. And I don't want that to be part of our show. Yes. I love that. You know, it's just, how do we get it to the backseat? How do we not have it driving the boat, like driving our emotions and our thoughts, which is really what I wanted to talk to you about because playing flood and all these things have surprised me 
as Mm -hmm. tools and ways to not let fear, we have to face it. Right. And you know what? That also for me has meant not just giving it to God in a way that I avoid an escape. Yes. Our faith can be the vehicle to do that. Talk to me about that. Do you see that happening? Like, I feel like as Christians, we can really hide. Yes. Yeah. I definitely think we can be more avoidant out of that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, that's just everything you're saying, just being helping our kids because it is tempting, whether it's the dentist that we just had yesterday with Milo, whether it's the day we have to move back into our flooded house as he has named it. Yeah. Which is sad to me. And I'm like, I want to rename that one day, but at the same time, I'm proud of you Mm. for calling it what it is. Yeah. And you know, I think that's, that's such a great, I mean, two things about that. One is, so we have had some play therapists on staff at Daystar and I've learned a lot about uh, play therapy wasn't really much of a thing when I was going through grad school, but, but the premise of it is that play is the language of young children. And so they express themselves and work themselves out, work, whatever it is that's going on, they're processing through play, which is exactly what you're saying Ziggy's doing, having a game called flood. That's what he's doing. He's emotionally processing what happened to you all, which is so wow. cool. Ziggy, wait, I said he. Is Ziggy yeah. a boy or girl? Mm-hmm. He's boy. a boy. Okay. Yeah. 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 So he's processing that, which is so cool. And I think what you're saying would be amazing. You know, I feel like, gosh, I mean, we literally, we just finished this first session of our um, summer retreat program, and it was all about identities and how God gives us new names. And, and if we're talking about that, maybe forever, this house is going to be symbolic of going back to the broken places to say, he gives us new names. Let's give our house a new name. Mm. And literally like, let's have a little something painted that says the name of our house and let's come up with it together. You know, I think, wow. and for anybody, those broken things that we go through to talk about what does really, what's one thing we can see that's redemptive in this. I talked with a group of kids about that this past week at camp, like they told their stories, which is, you know, basically the trauma they've been through, the hard things they've been through up to this point. And I, you know, I said, we don't see this side of heaven, all the ways that God redeems things, but I bet there's something you could say that is true about you that wasn't before that happened. What's one thing? And these were juniors and seniors in high school, so it's easier for them, but I think all of us. And so out of kind of naming those things, I think we can come to like, what does redemption look like, like in the midst of this? And, and that theme of there's always going to be some, and, and ultimately, you know, when we get to heaven, but we can see threads of it now or glimpses of it now. And I do think that's true. And that's not avoidant, you know, Mm -hmm. that's good. That's a big takeaway for me is just not avoiding just what I'm doing is what my kids are seeing and doing and mimicking and all of this. Right. And how tempting is it just to avoid? It really is. It's so tempting. Even going on a run and moving my body, which helps me a lot can be a form Mm -hmm. of avoidance. So being maybe aware of what we do that we may think is, has been called healthy, but maybe for us, is actually avoidance. Yes. And, and looking those fears, looking and naming those fears and then talking to those fears. Yes. That's, that's really helpful. Um, cause I can see we're in sort of this middle ground now for us in our trauma, where we're in a safe place. Our house is just sitting there, but once the day comes to move back in, there's going to be a whole nother layer of things probably to talk mm-hmm. through. Um, yes. and I think too, like you said, it took me till about two weeks in when Ziggy, my real feeler. So I have a feeler and a processor. I mean, they both do both those things, but just live more in those places. And so Milo will ask a million questions like the dentist yesterday, Ziggy had gone first and then Milo went the day after. So he had a whole bunch of questions and we got to a point where we were like, and I don't think this was the right call maybe, but we were like, Milo, we can't ask me one more question about the dentist and then we're not going to talk about the dentist anymore because we are starting to lose our minds. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's exactly, I mean, that's another thing that's fascinating about anxiety. So that's one of the ways we can recognize it is kids who ask repetitive questions. Mm-hmm. And what research says is we're never supposed to answer more than seven questions about the same topic mm. because it's not about the topic. Remember, it's not about the content. Not about and the so, content. 
So that's when I think we stop and say, what's your worry monster telling you right now? Because they're t- it's telling them something. Mm. And they think, you know, they don't know what the coping skills are. And so questions feels like their biggest strategy. So instead for, for either of your kids to be able to say, I'm afraid that X is going to happen at the dentist. And you can say then, so what do you want to say back to your worry monster? Mm. Because he's lying. Remember, he always lies. And mm. so what do you want to say back? And what do you think is true? But your instincts were great. You did awesome. I, I got to give Chris that credit. He said it out loud. And I was like, thanks for saying that out loud. I was about to go <laughs> next to all the dentist questions. And because it's like, I don't know if you'll have a cavity. Of course, it's a kid that's never had a cavity or and has perfect teeth. That's the one worrying about it. And I can relate to that um, a lot. And then when he's done and he conquered his worry monster, he made it through, which we did give some incentives. We said he could yeah. watch an episode of his favorite show if he could make it through sitting in the chair and not losing it. That's great. Okay. I just, I don't know what we're doing here, but cause he'll just, but I love what all of these motives, the why behind it, the reason for it. Cause sometimes I just feel like I'm throwing things to the wall to see if they stick and I'm not really sure, but you helping clarify for me, like I'm trying to get him in the present. I'm trying to get him out of the, the story he's telling himself that's on replay. Exactly. The story exactly. myself that's on replay. Cause I'm also thinking yeah. if you have a cavity, I'm not really sure how, like, that's going to be rough. And like, I don't know. And I can't guarantee you don't have one, but okay. Now we're obsessing about things that we don't know. So let's get in the present. And how do we do that? Um, that's, that's super, super helpful. Man, yeah. I could talk to you forever. And I we, know. We got to come by as a family, probably at some point. I've been we really love that. wanting to do that. Really wanting to do that. We love that. Thanks for the gift of your time and your expertise. Mm-hmm. And there's a million things that people are going to just, I just know I'm thinking to myself, but I'm also just thinking of just the real time conversations I've had Mm -hmm. through COVID and how many of us are living way more in scenarios than we are in real time. Oh, that's such a great statement. You're exactly right. Oh, it's very hard though, but you can have such like tangible takeaways and I'll list it all in the notes for people and they can how can they do a deeper dive into your books and where do they find you? How can they follow with you or contact you? So um, raisingboysandgirls.com is our website and all the books and the podcast information is there. The podcast is called Raising Boys and Girls and I do it with David Thomas and Melissa Trevathan. And then social media, we're kind of, well, we're all active on Raising Boys and Girls so they can follow us there or I am on Sissy Goff and it's a lot. I think I'm going to be doing especially a lot on anxiety in August. Cause I'm just feeling for so kids, so many kids that have not been in school now for possibly a year and a half and are going to be starting back. And so I want to be helping there. Ooh, so those are all to that. What'd you say? We'll be listening to that. <laughs> yeah. Kindergarten and like pandemic life and all the things like I can't even imagine. I can't wait for that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll be following along and we're so grateful for your offering and just for you. And thanks for hanging out with me in the garage. Well, it's so fun. I'm so glad to meet you and hopefully again soon. That sounds great. Okay, thanks a lot. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Thanks for listening in today, friends. And I just wanted to let you know that we have started a Patreon uh, a little while ago. Yeah. And you can go to www.patreon.com forward slash love and the outcome to check <laughs> out what we have in store there. There's some special things that are only for Patreon members. There are two different price tiers that you can join up. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just stay in touch with what we're doing. Yeah. I think you just put up a song from your old band. I, yes. Or you're about to. <laughs> yes. Stuff like that, that we're not really sharing elsewhere. It's kind of a behind the scenes exclusive access to Love and the Outcome. So meet us there. Like always, if this episode spoke to you, share it with someone who needs this in their life. Rate, review, subscribe, and check out Healing Hugs because they're just incredible. Check out the link.